Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today, we're going to be talking about load flow studies. The listeners, you may not be familiar with these, but that's okay. We have an expert, Mr. Kareem Josephs, who is the lead power systems engineer at Eaton, and he is going to walk us through this. So welcome, Kareem. Hey, thank you, Chris. appreciate you having me on. Yes, sir. hope you're doing well today. I am. Very good. So let's start off with these episodes with kind of giving a high-level overview of, a, of what a, a load flow study is. Okay, so a load flow study is a study that helps determine both system loading and whether or not proper voltages are maintained at each circuit due to voltage drop. Okay, that sounds really complex. Is there, <laughs> if, if, if we're going to explain it to a fifth grader, what will we say? Sure. So, I mean, how, how loaded is the piece of equipment? You know, like how much current do you have running through it? Is it over what the rating of the uh, of that set equipment is? Say if you've got a board that's only rated at 600 amps, what is the loading ratio? You know that you have that board sourcing. So say your load is 400 amps and your board is rated at 600 amps, then you have that corresponding ratio there. And as far as voltage is concerned, we have certain voltages that you want to maintain. You know, on a 40 volt board, the nominal voltage is 480 volts. And so you want to stay as close to that 480 volts as possible. And you have different standards that also mandate certain voltage ranges, like ANSI, ANSI being one of them for motor starting and stuff like that. So you want to just make sure that you're within the recommended tolerances for those boards when it comes to both loading and voltage. So I don't know if I'd be explaining that to a fifth grader, but (laughs) hopefully that's a more simplistic uh, response or answer to your question. Well, when I say fifth grader, I really, I'm really meaning me. So thank you for that because that, <laughs> that, that that helped a lot, man. So I really okay. appreciate that. I mean, a lot of these studies are very complex, and uh, you really broke it down for us. So hopefully, you broke it down for someone else too, not just me. But you know, so if we want to have this study and we're ready to 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 get started, what do we need to start gathering from the plant side to get going? Okay, so to start a load flow study. What you're really going to need is you're going to need loading data, the motor and horsepower. There are also dynamic loads, lump loads, you know, either kilowatt or KVAR loading for those data. If it's a static load, you'll need just the KW or the resistive load demand. And then you'll need the demand and diversity. And the demand is basically how much does, you know, respect of a piece of equipment pull and then the diversity, how frequently does that equipment run or engage? And so all of that really goes into the load flow. Like I said, your your motors, your static loads, lump loads, and demand and diversity of the equipment. And with all of that, you basically are comparing all of that cumulatively to the ratings of the boards or the panel boards, the MCC switch gear, all that stuff. You're comparing the amount of current draw that each of those pieces of equipment or components will pull to the the board withstand rating, or sorry, load ratings, not withstand rating, load ratings. Gotcha. Now, so a lot of these are, are, are we looking at basic nameplate type information here? Correct. Correct. That's right. You know, a, a board will have like a horizontal bus will be a 600 amp bus. I mean, you'll have a main breaker rated at 600 amps that will limit the amount of thermal current or the amount of, of current flow through that board to 600 amps. And then as far as load breakers or feeder breakers, you'll have, you know, maybe a you hundred know, amp breaker here, a 50 amp breaker here, 60 amp breaker. And once the diversity has been set properly, you can regulate the loading on that board based on, based on that. Okay. Now I think most of our the end users, they can get the nameplate data, but how about a one line? Because not everybody has a one line. So is that important to get started? So to get started, no, it's not really important to have a one line, even though 
having a one line is an engineer's best friend. I will tell you that because it makes it, it you basically have everything in one place and you're able to see how your loads are connected to said board. If you don't have it and in this day and age nothing is done by hand anymore, you would model all of the uh, the loads that we're talking about, the motors, the static loads, the lump loads. You would model all that in a program such as ETAP or SKM. And then by modeling that, you would uh, inherently create a one line. So you would you would be able to see how everything is interconnected. And so you would, by process, generate a one line, even if you didn't have one. So really all you need would be the motor data and the, you know, the location of, of, of its connection to the system or to the board. Okay. Well, I mean, that, that makes it even easier to get started. So let's say I have all that and I've walked through the process of, of getting this study done. What should I expect to come back for a deliverable? So a deliverable um, with lo- like a standard Eaton report, we have an executive summary that basically would tell you if there are any overloaded conditions. You know, you've got a board, like I said, rated at 600 amps and your load expectancy is 720 amps. Well, you know, that board would be deemed overloaded and protective devices overloaded. So you would not only look at the loading of the board, but you would also look at the voltages at the loading terminals as you're starting to pull more current through that board or through the transformer upstream, uh, your voltages. uh, And, uh, you know, again, depending on the length of impedance and cable and all that you have in the system, your voltages could also be considerably lower than it needs to be for especially for motor starting or for other devices that are very voltage sensitive so all of that would be detailed in the executive summary and later on in each respective section that the end user would be able to go through and you know read through and look at and you know one of the other things that we offer with eaton is we actually go through the report with the customer to kind of explain the findings anything that is a concern to us and pass that information over to the end user so that they are aware of it. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. I was like, you know, okay, now that I have that, you know, where do I know, you know, the best place to act from a risk management standpoint. So it sounds like that, that could be an, an expected deliverable through this process. Absolutely. Okay. So now for different types of studies, there's usually different types of, of, durations to get them done so what typically is the the cadence for a load study okay so i mean a load study would need to be completed i I would recommend anywhere between three to five years or as the load demand increases at the facility you know as you add more load to a board say i mean you start off with a board that is very lightly loaded and it's a brand new installation and say you know, if you were to put an ammeter on that board or have an ammeter there that's actually physically wired into the board, you know, a 600 amp board would be loaded at maybe 150 amps. Well, I mean, that's usually the the case. Very, very typical. Well, as the demand for more load comes in, more motors, more, more, more heaters, more whatever it is, components that are needed to be sourced from this board and you have spare breakers in place. As you continue to add load, a load flow study would need to be performed. And so having something like a dynamic model in place, like in, like like ETAP is, is one of the examples, you would quickly be able to go in and see, okay, I just added, you know, another 75 amps of current here. And now, so now instead of having 150 amps of total, now I've got 225 amps of current here now. And so you know, you would continue on that process. So, I mean, as you add load, you want to make sure that, you know, one, you're not over rating or over dutying the board, over loading the board. And two, if your runs are extremely long, then you can incur voltage drop due to impedance. And so you want to make sure that that motor at the end, way down there, you know, 800 feet away, you want to make sure you're doing something like upsizing your conductors, or you want to make sure that at the end where that panel is or that motor terminal is, that the proper voltage is there. So, I mean, to answer the question more succinctly, I would say as you add loads uh, of any significant amount, it would be wise to do a, uh, a load study. 
Okay, very good. So who who do you typically see as the owners of of lining up these load flow studies into plants, Kareem? Typically, the plant engineer, maintenance supervisor would be the ones who own this process. I, I, I generally also see the uh, electrical contractors. They will actually have spreadsheets. You know, when they come in and install these these different loads, they'll they'll have a, a load demand or a load diversity calculation done and they'll they'll hang on to that. A lot of times, at least in my experience, I have not seen them turn that over to the you know to the site facility or site manager or engineer, but rather they they keep that uh, information if the, if the person at the plant needs to know what the loading is, they can generally share the information with them. So yeah, I, I think for the most part, it's been just those individuals who would would be in charge of of you know that process. Okay, now let's say we 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 get that report back and we have something that is identified with some abnormal findings, whatever they may be, what would be the end user's process to correct these items? So, you know, whether or not the abnormal findings are under voltage condition, i.e. your voltage is too low uh, to start that motor, or you have an overduty transformer, that transformer is saturated because there's just too much current being pulled through, or the board is just overduty because it just has too much load on it, that end user would be able to identify and replace components as needed. And they would be able to see that piece of equipment right there is the one that, that has that overduty or under voltage condition. Okay. So Kareem, do you have any, you know, I know you've been in, in the game for a while. Have you, do you got any stories or experiences from uh, that you've encountered when doing these load flow studies that, that may be helpful to our, to our audience? Well, yeah, you, you know, my experience has kind of shown that uh, if there's a spare breaker, that somebody will inadvertently add a load with or without doing a load flow study. A lot of times I've seen that happen where, you know, oh, hey, we've got a spare. Oh, we've got five spares. Let's just go ahead and hang this, you know, 75 kVA transformer from here. And let's, you know, let's just do five of them. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they really didn't know that they were on the brink of, of, of being uh, over, overloaded to begin with. You know, again, the importance of having a load flow study done. And then, you know, over time, eventually the system will be overduty. You know, the transformer oversaturated, the voltages will be so low that motors will no longer start. And then once that happens, you know, they'll, they'll, call, they'll call Eaton or some other type of engineering company to come in and evaluate the circumstances. But, I mean, the thing we used to tell our customers, just because there's a spare doesn't mean you can put a load there. We need to make sure that you have sufficient capacity to be able to do that. So that's, that's something that I've seen quite a bit where, you know, especially when it comes to load flow, that, um, you know, it, it eventually kind of catches up with the person, <laughs> you know, if the load flow study is not done regularly. Right. So not, it's, it's not a it'll fit scenario, you know, go ahead and just throw it in there, right? Ex- exactly. Exactly. So we, we love to get to the why on eco ask why and before i get there i just must admit load flow study load flow analysis that just sounds cool man i'm sorry it just, <laughs> it just does you know it's probably my second favorite study behind arc flash you know nice <laughs> <laughs> but they are some cool names you gotta admit so there's an engineer out there just laughing somewhere hopefully oh yeah <laughs> so so get to the why you know why is a low flow study important Okay, so from a loading standpoint, you kind of want to ensure that the boards, uh, your panel boards, MCC, the motor control centers, switch gear, what, whatever it is, cables, transformers do not become overloaded. And overload means in most cases overheated too. And a lot of these, these components are rated thermally at some maximum current. And there are a lot of temperature coefficients and a lot of temperature formulas that show up once you reach a certain current draw through something, it heats up to that maximum, you know, in degrees C. And so you don't want to exceed that uh, because when you do that, then, you know, heat is really bad for the life of components. You don't want to get to a point where you're over overloading equipment because what you're going to do is decrease the amount of life. And the manufacturer will tell you that also. And, you know, from a, so that's, that's a loading issue. You don't want to, I mean, you want to, ensure that you're not overheating the piece of equipment. 
from a voltage standpoint, you want to make sure that your voltage drop is kept to a minimum. And the NEC has regulations of you know feeder and branch, what the percent voltage drop needs to be. And C also has recommendations also on what motor terminal, as far as the voltage is concerned for motor starting. And so you want to make sure that the voltage is kept to that minimum, especially for downstream branches. So those are really the in, or the the two main importances of of having a load flow study performed for loading purposes and for voltage constraint. Very good, man. That that was a great great why. Thank you for walking through that. You really unpacked so much useful information today. And now we know, you know, the importance of a load flow study, why we want to use it, you know, where it fits, who owns it. So just thank you so much for, for everything you walked through uh, today on this topic for our listeners, Kareem. You're very welcome, Chris. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.